Hello and welcome to another Chai Tutors video. In today's video we're going to be unpacking some of the key themes with regard to The Handmaid's Tale. Um, please make sure that you check out the characters video that I've made earlier because that video, um, in that video I've alluded to some of the key themes. Themes are really important to understand because they often form the basis for literature essays and my advice would be is as we go through the themes, think about the characters that relate to these themes so that you have something to talk about and something to frame your argument with. So I've compiled a list of different themes or different ideas that come up in the text um, and I've also provided some key quotes that you can use to substantiate any argument you make regarding these themes or key concepts. The first one compiles a whole um, a whole bunch of different sort of concepts to do with context. The will of the many over the will of the few, dystopia and the dangers of centralized power. So remember dystopia is a utopia that has gone wrong in some regard. Um, so it's meant to be this idealistic society where everyone has the, their place, but obviously it does not turn out that way. And a key aspect of dystopia, if you read a lot of dystopian novels, is you will see that there's this lack of humanity to the characters, that you're only seeing the characters or the people um, or human beings in one dimension for one aspect of their identity and you don't realize them as a full complete human being. We also see the dangers of centralized power in The Handmaid's Tale and we see this divide between you know is the government ruling for the will of the many or rather the will of the few and often what they campaign to be is you know the, for the will of the many um, and for the benefit of the many but really it is only benefiting a small part of the society. What's dangerous in the hands of the multitude, he says, with what may or may not have been irony, is safe enough for those whose motives are beyond reproach. A rat in a maze is free to go anywhere as long as it stays inside the maze. In the past, this would have been trivial enough remark, a kind of scholarly skip speculation. Right now, it's treason. They suspended the constitution. Newspapers were censored and some were closed down for security reasons. They've frozen them, any account with an F on it instead of an M. All they need to do is push a few buttons, were cut off. Humanity is so adaptable, my mother would say, truly amazing what people can get used to, as long as there are a few compensations. So really wonderful quotes over here. Um, the idea that newspapers are censored, that the constitution can be suspended, this just shows that human, um, humans can, you know, really take on all this power and centralized power can be extremely dangerous because with the press of a button, you can deprive um, you know, 50% of the population, any sort of autonomy um, or respect at all. And the idea of freedom, you know, they will claim, governments will claim that their people have freedom, but you have, you know, what is freedom? Is it freedom within a certain maze, within a certain set of boundaries? The loss of humanity. She could not walk for a week. It was the feet they do the, for the first offence. They didn't care what they did to your feet and hands, even if it was permanent. You can't have them taken out. Whatever it is must be carried to term. Most of the time they aren't needed at all. They're, on, they're only allowed in if it can't be helped. Maybe it's about who can do what to whom and be forgiven for it. So the loss of humanity, which you can sort of equate these quotes with violence as well. The first few quotes talk about um, more is punishments for trying to escape the Red Center and what they do to her and how there's absolutely a lack of humanity or respect for a human being. They will physically torture you. Um, and remember, they don't care about the handmaid's feet and hands because it doesn't function to serve them in terms of their main purpose in life, which is to bear children. The fourth quote, you can't have them taken out, whatever must be, must be carried to term. That has got to do with, you know, if a handmaid does become pregnant, they are not allowed to, even if there's some sort of deformity or something wrong with the child, they have to carry the child to term. So we can notice the relevance of the story within today's climate. Most of the time they aren't needed at all. This was talking about the doctors who were standing outside when Janine was having a baby. They are not to be called in um, unless it's very, very dire. Um, and this just shows the complete loss of humanity in a society. You're not even going to um, have doctors to help this woman give birth or to be there to check that she's going to be okay. Um, you know, there's these other laws that have, you know, superseded the, um, this basic sense of humanity. Trust in betrayal. The moment of betrayal is the worst. The moment when you know beyond any doubt that you've been betrayed, that some other human being has wished you that much evil. 
So this is when Alfred is thinking back to how her, Luke, and her daughter tried to escape and how someone ratted them out, someone um, told on them, and they were, um, you know, they were sort of captured and well, we don't really know what happens to Luke and her daughter. But we have an inkling what happens to her daughter, we don't know what happened to Luke, and Alfred is captured and taken to be trained as a handmaid. So that idea of trust and betrayal, and betrayal going hand in hand with trust. Love and companionship, it's a lack of love we die from. So there it was, out in the open, his wife didn't understand him. Something to fill the time. He occupies space, he is more than a shadow. To him I'm not merely empty. What he wants is intimacy, but I can't give him that. So love and companionship is a really important theme because we need to look at the commander's relationship with Alfred and whether he is a true companion or not um, and that's up for debate and you can argue it either way um, and I think it's something that Alfred does enjoy her time with the commander because it's a way to fill the time because she's incredibly bored. She is literally, she just has to sit in her room a lot of the time and absolutely do nothing. Um, and so it's a it's a way for her to to fill the time and have some sort of connection with someone because the only other person she really has a connection with is Arthur but they have to sort of whisper under their breaths and she makes those comments as lack of love we die from and then that point of his wife didn't understand him that shows the strain in the relationship between the commander and Serena and which is quite interesting I think we spoke about it in the characters um, video as well but this society is supposed to be serving them and yet they are going and they are resisting aspects or laws or rules of that society and so really who is the society working with working for if it's not even you know fulfilling or satisfying the commander and Serena memory our happiness is part memory all i can hope for is reconstruction the way love feels is always only approximate and this is so all this memory you know um, we spoke about this in characters um, in the character videos with offered all these flashbacks all these um, memories that she has are significant they keep her going they keep her motivated um, to survive and they they fuel her sense of passive resistance or resistance Revolution and a new world order. I don't have those things anymore, the clothes and hair. I wonder what happened to all other things, looted, dumped out, carried away, confiscated. So I think a, a theme that links to this is the idea of loss. Because Alfred and all these different characters, they've lost any vestige of their old lives. And that's what's so significant about the relationship between Moira and Alfred, is it's something that transcends the, take, the takeover of power and this revolution. The limitations of power. For every rule, there is always an exception. This too can be depended on. Whatever is silenced will clamour to be heard, though silently. Behold, behind this particular door, taboo dissolved. And so this is also linked to the theme of resistance, the limitation of power. Power cannot trump everything. Um, you know, you can have the most shocking and restrictive regime, but you will still be able, there will still be a glimmer of resistance. No matter what happens, no matter how many shadows there are, there will still be that light. And we can see in the society that for every rule, there is an exception. So the commander breaks rules, Serena breaks rules, every single character breaks a rule at some point. Religion. Ordering prayers from soul scrolls is supposed to be a sign of piety. So um, that just shows the distortion of religion and Christianity and the distortion of knowledge and the indoctrination. So if you just purchase some of these um, prayers from Soul Scrolls, then you know you are holy. You don't have to really do anything, um, and that's sort of the epitome of you know the distortion of of a religion. Gender roles and the meaning and purpose of life. About looking at her body, um, Alfred says, "I don't want to look at something that determines me so completely." That is such an interesting. Um, thing because she has been completely dehumanized just to produce a child that's her only fundamental one and single only purpose in her life and so looking at her body she um, she, she doesn't like it because it's not something that she feels like she controls because she really does not have control over her own over, over herself and over her body um, but also it's something that determines her so completely so that's a really nice point there this is not recreation, even for the commander. This is serious business. The commander too is doing doing his duty. So this is talking about the ceremony, and it's talking about like Alfred's entire purpose in life is to produce a child for Commander Fred and for Serena Joy. The next theme is the dangers of humanity, um, and this is a lot of 
Aunt Lydia and Aunt Elizabeth, you are a transitional generation. They will accept their duty with willing hearts because they will have no memories of any other way because they won't want things they can't have. Here, Aunt Lydia is speaking to the women she is training at the Red Centre to be handmaids. And this is really um, scary. And that's why I've labeled it as the dangers of humanity because it's the power of humanity to indoctrinate and to make these you know, statements that she's basically saying that their daughters that you know they're the next generation of handmaids will not know any better but the confinement with which they've been given and so humanity we have this incredible capacity to do a lot of good but we also have a very dangerous side the oppression of women and double standards if i let the noise get out into the air it will be laughter most of the stores carrying things for men are still open. It's just the ones dealing in what they call vanities that have been shut down. It's only the women who can't, who remain stubbornly closed, damaged, effective. The problem wasn't only with the women, he says. The problem was with the men. There was nothing for them anymore. Nature demands variety for men. It stands to reason. It's part of the procreational strategy. It's nature's plan. So um, this oppression oppression of women and the double standards um, very relevant in today's society as well um, this this line over here may not seem to to fit into this um, you know fit into anything really but this is offered in her room and she's like she's scared to laugh and I think that just really shows the oppression of you know any sort of feeling or emotion that she's allowed to express speaking about the changeover she says all of the women's stores like you know the ones that apparently only selling vanities were shut down but all the men's stores of the same variety are still open um, and then a key thing with this is that it's never assumed to be the man's fault why um, you know why the wife cannot be pregnant it's always just the woman's fault um, and obviously that leads to you know Serena having to um, convince Offer to sleep with Nick because there might be actually something wrong with the commander. It may not be Serena at all, but Serena is blamed for it. Um, and that adds a little bit of a sympathetic element to her character. But it's always the women who can't, so it's always the women's problem. Um, and the commander says these last two lines about, you know, the nature of men and women. And he says that, you see, women are suffering in the society, but men are really suffering in the society because there's no sort of desire for the women because of the new rules which is deeply problematic to say that the men are suffering more than the women in Gilead and society um, and then the last line which is something um, very commonly heard but an extreme double standard the idea that men need variety they need to sleep with many women and women are not the same like that they have no sort of desire and they should not um, indulge in that the next theme is very important, re-education and indoctrination, knowledge and its link to power. The Bible is kept locked up, so the servants wouldn't steal it. It is an incendiary device, who knows what we'd make of it. The sin of reading, I knew they made that up. Sometimes you can find things out on birthdays. Moira was like an elevator with open sides. She made us dizzy, already we were losing the taste for freedom, already we were finding these walls secure. Books right out in plain, plain view, no locks, no boxes, no wonder we can't come in here, it's an oasis of the forbidden. I was evil, but I didn't feel evil. So Alfred's, um, you know, she keeps her sanity, she keeps her memories, she shows us this through her flashbacks, but she still cannot deny the impact of indoctrination on her. So she, as much as she resists it and she does think of her past life and she finds comfort in that in some regard, she is still heavily indoctrinated and we can see who the people she interacts with and how she um, you know, positions herself to society, how she's supposed to behave. So knowledge is definitely linked to power. Um, the Bible is kept locked up. The commander's office has all these books and it's just fascinating to offer it. It hasn't seen them for so long. And she loves playing Scrabble because it's actually using her mind and it's using her knowledge and it's using some sort of skill which she's been deprived of for so long. Um, the idea that knowledge can be incendiary, it can cause something major. I mean, this is obviously, if you think historically of, you know, the, the advent of the printing press and how that changed knowledge forever. And it changed hierarchy forever because, um, you know, in Gileadian society, we've sort of gone back to that hierarchical stage of not everyone has access to knowledge. So therefore, the people with knowledge are powerful. 
I knew they made that up so even the sense of like these characters they are aware that this is made up but there's this element of fear that is so incredibly crippling that they can't do anything about it and this line about Moira I used it in the character of Moira as well but I repeated it here because it's such a fascinating um, simile um, because it speaks about how they envy Moira and they just look at her in such awe because of what she's able to do. She's able to, to resist um, with all this integrity and all of this passion. And she notes how, Offred notes how her and the rest of the handmaids in training, we were already losing the taste for freedom. We were already finding these walls secure, meaning like this indoctrination was already getting to them and they were already becoming sort of complacent and Moira was the only one sort of fighting against that. So you can see the power of indoctrination and re-education. Sorry, just before we move on to the next thing, you can also see this theme with regards to Janine and how she completely changes um, and her horrific sort of presentation of her rape story at the at the Red Center um, and also how she loses her sanity at the end of the of the novel you can see her degradation due to this theme of indoctrination and re-education. Moving on to power versus powerlessness. To refuse to see him could be worse. There's no doubt it holds the real power. It's a bargaining session. Things are about to be exchanged. She who does not hesitate is lost. I'm not giving anything away. Selling only. Apologies for the typo there in about. Now he's compromised himself. It's as if he's offered me drugs. After a request like that, there's always a next time, whether you say yes or no. So this is a key aspect if you want to prove that the relationship between the commander and Alfred is, is sort of, yeah, it's non-real, it's fake, it's, um, it's just a power play. Because really, there is the power versus the powerful versus the powerless. And Alfred is clearly powerless with regard to her relationship with Serena and with the commander. And so anything that she does according to their wishes is not any form of resistance on her part. Um, as much as she'll get into trouble with Serena if she goes and meets with the commander, she will get into maybe more trouble if she doesn't meet with the commander. So um, if you want to prove that, you know, maybe she's not entirely resistant at all because she just has to follow, you know, the things that she does against the rules, like sleeping with Nick and having this relationship with the commander, it's all because she is powerlessness powerless she has to listen even though it might put her at a disadvantage and it might cause her to actually suffer in the long run and to deal with the consequences whereas the others will not deal with them due to their status in society suffering this links to the loss of humanity talking about moira's punishments she could not walk for a week it was the feat they do for the first offense apologies for the typo there they didn't care what they did to your feet and hands, even if it was permanent. Pain marks you, but too deep to see. Then we have a very important theme. I keep saying that, but these are also quite significant. Sanity and the power of the mind. The mind is a site of resistance. The things I believe can't all be true. Sanity is a valuable possession. I hoard it the way people once hoarded money. I save it so I will have enough when the time comes. Otherwise, you live in the moment, which is not where I want to be, but that's where I am. There's no escaping it. Time's a trap. I'm caught in it. I would steal myself. I would pretend not to be present, not in the flesh. And this is the idea that I really want you to, to consider and to, and to contemplate, is that Offred's mind is the site of her resistance, that the fact that she maintains her sanity and that she's able to resist the full overwhelming effect of the indoctrination the fact that she's able to think critically in a society that has been trying to re-educate her not to think critically, not to think at all really, but just to be and just to exist. She lives in her imagination. It's a coping mechanism. Well, not necessarily her imagination, but in her memories and in her flashbacks. And I think that's a really significant theme. And it's one where, you know, her resistance is not overt, it's covert. And a lot of it happens in her mind. She recognizes that she can't all the things that she hears that cannot actually be true. She is aware of her situation and awareness is sort of the first step towards, you know, awareness and understanding of your situation allows you not to just get, you know, caught up in it. Control and the life or role of the handmaid. I am too important, too scarce for that. I am a natural resource, worthy vessel. 
I am leading a pampered life. The bell that measures time is ringing. Time here is measured by bells, as ones in nunneries. The door has no lock. There are no razors. Hair must be long but covered. At testifying, it's safe to make things up. It's safer to make things up than to say you have nothing to reveal. It was my own fault. I let them on. I deserved the pain. Each month I watch for blood, fearfully, for when it comes it means failure. I have failed once again to fulfill the expectation of others, which have become my own. This is supposed to signify that we are one flesh, one being. What it really means is that she is in control of the process and thus of the product. We are containers. It's only the insides of our bodies that are important. Usually we walked with our heads bent down, our eyes on our hands and our, our eyes on our hands or the ground. I'm the vehicle for her hope. We are for breathing purposes. We are two-legged wombs. That's all, sacred vessels, long-sleeved even in the summer to keep us from the temptation of our own flesh. This rope segregates us, marks us off, keeps us from others, from contamination by us, makes for us a coral or pen, saved by childbearing. So lots of different things going on here, but it's talking about the role of the handmaid and there's some wonderful quotes you can use there. Um, you know, right, really nice and simple ones, not too many pronouns. Um, this idea that they are, there's sort of this irony because they are so important to society. They are this natural resource, they're the sacred vessel, but yet they're treated so poorly. They're treated as though they're not even human beings, that they're just this vessel, just this container. So there's a deep irony in that. The door has no lock and there are no razors because they've had such problems with um, handmaids committing suicide um, and trying to injure themselves to get out of this dreadful situation. Um, this idea that their bodies must be covered, it's only the insides that count, um, you know, this idea of resisting temptation because an idealistic society, if you think about the idea of utopia or this idea of civilization is that you are, you are removed from desires because that scene is somewhat animalistic. Um, this idea that this is a really important part of the quote, obviously you don't remember this entire quote because it's far too long, but this important part I have failed once again to fulfill the expectation of others which have become my own and that's also that idea is she's in control of the process and thus the product so Alfred's child will not be her child it will be Serena's child and she realizes that and she realizes when she sees the blood when she knows she's not pregnant that she has failed in her duty and in failing in her duty she's failed in the duty of others and in the expectation of others so this interwoven nature between the characters that what one character does has an effect on the other character um, is significant but also it just shows that she is not even a human being herself she's not treated as a human being with a life and with dreams of her own or even a life of her own she is the property of somebody else um, so lots of different these quotes are really um really good ones to take note of because they will come into play in literally any essay no matter what the topic was the inflexibility of roles versus the interchangeable nature of identity in this house we all envy each other so this is a bit of a deeper idea um it's not necessarily like that important um but it's quite significant that in the society we spoke about, you know, everyone has their role and it's one role that is all consuming. But it's also, so there's like an inflexibility in that. But then also there's this interchangeable nature because these people remember a life before this complete transformation. So, you know, there is this inflexibility and this is my role, this is what I must do. But there is that recollection of what they used to be before. Freedom. There is more than one kind of freedom, said Aunt Lydia. Freedom to and freedom from. In the days of anarchy, it was freedom to. Now you are being given freedom from. Don't underrate it. So this can definitely fall under the indoctrination one. This is one of my favorite quotes because it really shows the extent of re-education or doctoring a certain approach to life. And here she's trying to convince these women that they have this freedom from all these terrible things that women used to face in society. In the days of, you know, they call, she calls them the days of anarchy. In the past, women had freedom to do whatever they wanted, but now they have freedom from all of these terrible things that they are supposedly, by being handmaids or living in this Gileadian society, are protected from. So you can just see the levels of manipulation and distortion of reality. 
So here are another few um, themes to think about. Appearance versus reality. So that links to, you know, Offred's character, how she appears to be versus what she's thinking in reality. Resilience. So um, Offred is an extremely resilient character. Moira is resilient. So many different characters are resilient in their ambitions. They, um, well, not ambitions, but in their sort of will to survive and thrive in some way, shape or form. Passive versus active resistance. We've discussed that a lot. Ambiguity, the unknown and concealment. A lot of this novel is about these ambiguous ideas. This, the unknown, we don't know what happens to this character, we don't know what happens at this point in time. We don't even know certain people's names, we don't know Alfred's real name. And that ambiguity leads to this sort of chaotic, or not necessarily chaotic, but this distorted version of reality that we're dealing with. The pursuit of progress and what human beings will do in order to attain progress and progress in inverted commas what does progress actually mean what does a civilized and inverted commas society mean um, what are we trying to what are we trying to produce and how are we going about that process what is this utopia that we're actually trying to create class and status and how this is decided so obviously the reason why Alfred is a handmaid is she married a divorced man so thinking about the connotation of status, the connotation of class, how these things are decided, what the double standards are in terms of that decision, and ultimately going back right to the beginning, who does it benefit and why does it benefit them in that way? I hope that that was helpful. Please remember to like and subscribe and to check out the characters video on Handmaid's Tale, as well as the literature essay skills video and the how to integrate a quotes video. Thank you so much. See you in the next video.